Hey, what's up guys? Phoenix here, and this weekend we had an event, and the results of that event honestly are incredibly surprising to me. It was something that I never actually considered was going to be a thing that would happen, like, almost ever in the history of competitive play. Like, I 100% did not think that this deck was going to do nearly as well as it performed, but lo and behold, Zephyrus won the UDS in Sacramento, and that just blows my mind. But, for real though, uh, we're going to be talking about the fact that World Chalice won YCS Bochum 2018 in Germany. It was the largest European YCS in history. I believe that it's like either the second or third largest YCS period or something to that effect. Uh, YCS Long Beach, I believe, is still like the, the biggest YCS event, not counting WCQs. But it's definitely up there. It's if it's not in the top five of you know sizes of events that has been held in terms of like YCS level events, I would be very surprised. But so Marco Perico won with World Chalice. Uh, it's a very interesting time because I've been getting tons of like I basically slept through the entirety of Bochum. Uh, like it's just it's very far in the future in terms of my time zone. I stayed up and like watched like one match of day two, but then I went to sleep and I woke up as people were texting me saying that World Chalice was in the finals and obviously that's such a uh, that's a weird text to wake up to, especially when he has a list that I can't really get behind and agree with and that's definitely something people have been wanting to know is that I've been getting messages on multi-platform you know basises of what do you think of this guy's deck list? Have you seen his deck list? And yeah, I knew of his deck list like basically right after he won. Me and another person in my own Discord, we basically just played the VOD on slow-mo and the first like three times he looks through his deck uh, when he resolves his Lee Search, his Transmodify Summon, and his uh, Shine Ball Summons, you basically see all of his deck like in those three instances because he thumbs through the cards very cleanly in most cases. Uh, so we had like 41 out of the 42 cards in his list, like easily. The only card we didn't have uh, that we didn't know he played was the third Kaiju, the Lightning Strike Kaiju. Uh, we just knew he played 42, but we didn't know what the 42nd card was. Uh, but so his list is very interesting, uh, to say the least. It's definitely not something I could say I'm a fan of. And I should say right now, like, none of what I'm about to say is trying to take anything away from Marco or his achievements. Like, it's a, it's a wonderful achievement to win a YCS, to win a large YCS, and to win with a deck like World Chalice. Especially considering that his list is mind-bogglingly different from anything that I would have like entered an event like this with. It's actually very strange. World Chalice is one of those decks that I actually didn't really want to enter any events with this format. At least, I felt like it wasn't good enough to enter Atlanta with because the format was very undefined and people were still maining things like Triple Ash Blossom and stuff like that. Uh, but now going into Bochum and this entire weekend, things were a bit more defined in terms of people weren't maining Ash Blossoms, people were maining less hand traps, specifically in the Pendulum deck because the hand traps make your hands more bricky. So I feel like this was probably an optimal time Time for a deck like this to do well in retrospect. Uh, I don't think that this deck will have largely that much success in the future. I really enjoy World Chalice, but I don't play the deck because I think I'm ever going to win a YCS with it. I play it because it's incredibly complex. In terms of rogue strategies and rogue options, it is one of the strongest ones because it does so many unfair things when it gets moving, and there's a lot of different ways that you can play the deck. Now, the biggest thing that stands out about his list uh, that people have been constantly berating me for is the fact that he did play Eva and two Herald of the Orange Lights. Meanwhile, I have a video still sitting on my channel about my opinions on why you should not play Eva. Now, that was an old format, one. Uh, that was when we had more options for play. Now the deck, since we've lost Gofu and lost Dandelion, the deck has to be a lot more streamlined and optimized with multiple trans modifies to get to Venus, so your chances of resolving Eva are a lot better. Now, do I think it's 100% correct to play Eva? No. I still do not think it's 100% correct to play Eva. However, there was something that Marco was doing that literally nobody ever brought up to me in any instance of trying to justify why Eva was good, and it was honestly the only thing I saw that he did that made the card actually just fantastic. And that was the interactions he was doing with Firewall Dragon in the finals specifically. And he even mentioned this in his player interview, of if he could resolve Eva on turn one to search for a Herald and a Lee, right? 
He would do so, and then he would try to summon Firewall Dragon and Gamma Seal, and the Firewall Dragon would be co-linked with Skull Dread and another monster, like an Eeb. His board was very weak in terms of how it looked from, like, what most people would try to do with World Chalice boards of, like, trying to extra link your opponent, or trying to summon Trigate Wizard and do all this fancy shit. But it was actually a lot stronger than what you might actually, like, have, you know, realized, because what he was doing was, since that Firewall was co-linked with two, when his opponent would summon a monster that he'd want to bounce, he would use Firewall to bounce his opponent's monster, but then return Eva from his graveyard to his hand. That way, when he uses his Herald of the Orange Light, he would be discarding Eva with Herald, which is something that I mentioned in my Eva video of, like, the only time I'd ever want to be resolving Herald of the Orange Light is if I'm discarding an Eva with it. Uh, basically, because then what that does is it turns his Firewall Dragon into two disruptions rather than just one. Because he's at, he's bouncing the Eva to his hand while bouncing an opponent's monster, so that's one disruption. But then the Herald of the Orange Light discarding Eva for the second disruption is then searching another copy of Lee and another Orange Light from his deck to be a fourth interruption, uh, or third interruption, uh, combining with the uh, Gamma Seal. Fourth uh, and fifth combining with the Gamma Seal. So basically, he has tons of interruptions, and that's a play that literally nobody brought up. Absolutely nobody brought that play up to me at all in any way, shape, or form when, like, I made the comp, like, when I was dealing with comments on that video, when people were presenting arguments to me, when I was looking at people who were playing Eva, no one brought that up. So that's an, actually an interesting thing. I feel like if you were going to play Eva, this is probably the best package to run, because, again, when people were, like, testing Eva and were asking me about it, like, it was always like at least three Herald of the Orange Lights, one to two Evas in the main deck, Christia in the main deck, uh, and like Herald of the Green Light or Purple Light is like a splashed other card just so that you always have targets for Eva. That's an engine that I still believe is hopefully incorrect because that's a lot of cards, that's a lot of bricks. This sort of engine where it's just the Orange Lights and just the Eva is probably the most correct way you could have to play it and it might be something that merits further testing in the future. Do I believe it's correct to play Eva? No. Like, still no. Like, I'm I'm one of those people that, like, I'm not going to let one result of someone winning a YCS with the card sway the entirety of my thought process, because that's bending yourself to anecdotal evidence. But if you actually, you know, take the result and test upon it, which is something that I have been doing and I'm going to continue doing, that is how you actually come to correct results. Because everything people were telling me about Eva was, oh, you could do things with Summon Sorceress, you could do all this, all this, all that. None of that was ever, like, very impressive to me because it still involved your deck having bricks in it. Meanwhile, this, you have the smallest package you could play the card in, and you're using it with your Firewall Dragon to turn your Firewall Dragon into an extra disruption and an extra negation than it already is. Like, turning Firewall into two negations, was, or two disruptions, rather, one disruption and one negation, so two forms of disruption, was fantastic. Like, that was the play that I saw that was like, wow, nobody ever brought this up to me, and I'm surprised I didn't see it myself, because every time I resolved Firewall, I was always trying to bounce two opponent's monsters with it, or I was using it to, like, return a card that was a combo piece from my graveyard to my hand. But with Eva, if you use Eva with uh, the Herald of the Orange Light, then you're getting another Orange Light. So, like, that's actually a really cool play, a really cool application. Can it still break your hands? Yes, but it's a small enough engine that it probably will not matter that much. And also, with three transmodifies, you could draw into the Orange Lights or the Eva and transmodify any of them to either Lee or Venus, uh, based off which one you had. So, there's, there's a couple of different, like, reasons why the deck has streamlined its way more towards Eva being better. You know, with the loss of Gofu, the loss of Dandelion, the deck has to be more Venus-focused, hence the three transmodifies in his build. And so things just sort of developed naturally for the card to be a little bit better positioned. I'm still not sure if it's correct or not. I still stand by my original statement of I think the card is suboptimal, but it does still allow you to generate stronger boards. That is a fact that I cannot dispute. Uh, and it's strictly because of that Firewall Dragon play that nobody else brought up to me. But anyway, now that I've spent like eight minutes of this video talking about Eva, uh, the Kaiju package is interesting. Uh, I don't know if I agree with Dogaran or Lightning Strike. I mean, they're basically Raigeki in an OTK engine. But, like, they're played so that he can, like, go second with the deck. And any other Kaiju that actually benefits his game state when he goes first might be better. I mean, this was a package that I was testing before YCS Atlanta. I was testing one Gamma Seal, but I was testing two Radians instead of the Dogaran and the Lightning Strike Kaiju. So, we're on the same, like, mental wavelength of, you know, Kaijus are good for outing boards going second, but... 
In my build, I wanted to play Radian because Radian with the field spell can generate a token, meaning you can special it out of your hand off Firewall, you can bring it back with Aurum, you can special it out of your hand off Skulldread, and you can combo with it. It counts as two monsters. Uh, so I'm very interested in why like he would play Dogaran and Lightning Strike, other than for the fact that they were just simply big, because in his deck profile he said that he wanted to give his opponent a kaiju that did nothing for them with the counters, and Radian doesn't do anything for your opponent, because you're going to be clearing it off the board in almost all instances that you give it to them. Uh, and meanwhile, if you like, <laughs> if you let the the Dogaran or the Lightning Strike Kaiju last until your opponent's turn, that's arguably worse for you than giving them Radiant and getting them a token, because they have a Raigaki <laughs> or a card they can attack three times. So that was interesting uh, to look at. But overall, the rest of his list like is very standard. I don't like the fact that Exodius isn't in his list, at least as a one of. Uh, he mentioned it in one of his player interviews. Of Exodius was a card that you could pro you could possibly run. I think the card would be better than Ferret in the slot. Ferret is a card that like I like, but I'm not really impressed by because like it only really combos with Skull Dread. Now that is like the entire purpose of your deck is to turbo out at least one Skull Dread per turn. But it just seems like Exodius fills the slot a little bit better than Ferret does, in my opinion because it allows your play strings to be a little bit more, you know, uh, protected and fluidous, uh, and like, uh, like it's an extender. Ferret is only an extender if you're already capable of playing into a Skull Dread or a Firewall or something like that, whereas Exodius is always going to be an extender because it's always just a free special summon, and then you can combine it with, like, Venus or whatever. Like, it, it does arguably the same things that Ferret does, just a little bit less unfairly, but it does them more consistently. Uh, so, like, that was something that I was interested in as well, like, the fact that, like, he just wasn't playing Exodius. Uh, Exodius is a card that I don't think that I would ever cut from World Chalice, uh, because it's just, like, you need to be able to play a long game. That's something that really, like, strikes me about his deck list was that, uh, it's like, it looks like it's very all or nothing. It's very much you blow your load once, and if you can't finish the game out, then you're done. Uh, and, like... So basically his deck was like a one trick pony in that regard of it has very little recovery option and very little like uh, very little like ways to play in the long game because like that's something that Exodius has always been a huge thing for um, is that it, like you can throw cards into back row and then Exodius them back into your deck and then like if your opponent is low on resources then you can start playing again the next turn and like you have all your resources and your opponent doesn't like that's a pretty big thing. Uh, but regardless, I mean, his deck list is pretty standard in most facades and most areas. Uh, the two Skull Dreads are kind of interesting. Uh, I think that you wouldn't need two of them if you're playing Exodius, uh, me personally. But uh, the fact that he's playing Beckon to make Baguska is cool. The fact that he's Siding Dweller is also cool. It's something that I've considered in my testing. Uh, I was just basically playing Chosen for a long time, but then, you know, Baguska has become a little bit more powerful in the last, you know, couple of weeks. Siding Jinzo for the Transmodify play is really cool. Uh, that was a joke, like, five months ago, but it turns out it's actually just, like, real. Um, I don't know if he actually did it during the tournament, but, I mean, it's a cool play to do, uh, especially, like, if you do it, like, turn one uh, against, like, some deck like Paleo or something. Uh... But otherwise, like, his deck is very standard, and there's a lot of very powerful cards in his side deck of, like, three Mind Control, three Evenly, the Mask of Restricts, the Anti-Spells. Like, his entire deck is built to be, like, it has, a lot, it has a lot of very powerful cards maximized in it, in terms of the side deck and the main deck, in terms of, like, the Venus, Transmodify, Brilliance, all that sort of stuff. Uh, there's just, the things that, like, I don't agree on in his list are the things like the Rescue Ferret and the Eva package, but the Eva package I can sort of, you know, I can sort of like start testing that on my own and probably, I'm, it's growing on me more with the firewall play. That's the only play, like I said, I've ever seen anyone do that actually makes it look like something that would be worthwhile to do, is turning firewall into extra negations by bouncing Eva to hand. That was, again, something that nobody ever brought up. Everything that everyone was bringing up was things like Summon Sorceress, all these things that, like, just require you to be playing the game, like, super hard. Meanwhile, like, if you can make one Firewall Dragon and resolve an Eva, like, that's just three forms of disruption, because you have the Herald, you get the second Herald, and then you've got the Firewall. So, like, that's, that's a cookie-gutter good number. I like that number. Like, the fact that Firewall can just make you have three interruptions if you resolved Eva on the turn that you summon Firewall, that's actually just great. That's very good. But, basically... I'm, congratulations to him for winning the event. I'm a little annoyed that World Chalice won this event because now people know what my cards do. People have been asking me if I'm happy that World Chalice won, and I'm happy for the man winning, 
and I'm kind of proud that the deck has a win, at least now like the deck isn't absolutely terrible in players' minds, but at the same time, one of the biggest benefits of me playing this deck was that every time I played an opponent, they had to pick up and read my cards, and I got away with some crazy shit of like, just summoning Lee and saying, activate effect, and my opponent would be like, what does that do? It was like, it, I'd say, it's Stratos, it searches a World Chalice card, and they would just activate Ash on it, and then I would just play Transmodify and be like, ha, I got you. But now people have a much better knowledge of how the deck operates because they've seen it win an event. So now, like, that sort of, like, that sort of advantage you got from your opponents not knowing nearly as much about your deck as you do is now gone. Like, you don't have that extra added layer of benefit of your opponents don't know what you're doing nearly as well as you do, so they're going to be, like, less likely to hit the right cards with their hand traps or with whatever. Uh, or they're likely to miss side cards or whatever. Because, like, there was one person on live stream, uh, I think it was, like, round 8 or round 9, that was playing against World Chalice, and he cited anti-spell against World Chalice. And World Chalice plays, like between 25 to 30 monsters and like 10 to 12 spells at max. Now all of those spells are very high impact spells, but the monsters 100% can carry the entirety of the deck and anti-spell doesn't really do that much against the deck except cut it off from a couple of extenders that the deck may or may not have even opened. So like, it's things like that that you could take advantage of before this event and now I feel like those are gonna be taken advantage of of a little bit less after this event. So, am I happy that Marco won? Am I happy that he got a win with World Chalice? Am I happy that World Chalice is at least a bit more validated as a good deck? Then absolutely, yes. But I'm a bit more annoyed now that if I want to play this deck, there are going to be at least a little bit more people that know what's going on with this deck and know what to deal with. So, that's the biggest thing. Like, that's one of the biggest aspects of playing a good rogue deck is that, like, if your deck is rogue, people aren't going to know about it as much. But now this deck has a YCS win under its belt, so like people are gonna know what these cards do, at least in some capacity. But that's basically my opinions on it. Like, I, I think the I think the list is odd in terms of like the the choice to not play Exodius, but to play Ferret and Heart, which are extenders. In my um, in my mind, they're inferior. Like Ferret is an inferior extender to Exodius, and Heart is an inferior recovery option to Exodius. So the fact that both of these are in this list instead of just playing Exodius's, I find a little bit strange. I mean, Exodius isn't one is not a necessary card by any stretch of the imagination, but it makes your game plan a lot more safe. It's a safety net, and so like you kind of need that with this sort of deck because you run through resources like almost instantly turn one. Uh, so like having any safety net at all is kind of valuable. But I digress. Those are pretty much my opinions on it. This that's my people wanted me to make a video on my thoughts of like the event and all that sort of stuff. So here they are. I tried to uh, do whatever I could to like not be uh, ignorant about it. Like that's the thing is I've been talking to a lot of people have been commenting on my uh, like Eva video specifically of like looks like you were wrong. Eva's correct. It's like no, that's not how this works. It has one success. That is grounds for us to go back and retest the engine under this new format. But it does not mean it was 100% always correct from the get-go. It means that there is more information to go upon. And like I said, the firewall play bouncing Eva to his hand is actually just amazing. Like, if there's anything that makes me run this card now, it is that specific play and nothing else. Because everything else is dumb. It's stupid. It's win more. But the Eva bouncing itself with firewall, that's fantastic. Because, again, firewall by itself with a Herald in your hand that you searched last turn, Firewall plus Eva turns into three disruptions. Two of them are monster negates. Like, that's actually powerful. But anyway, that's going to be it for this video. Let me know what you guys thought in the comments down below. If there's anything you want more opinions on, definitely feel free to ask. I'll do my best to answer, all that sort of stuff. But other than that, thanks for watching, guys. Like, comment, subscribe. Do all the nonsense you usually do. Check out the links in the description. Thanks for your time as usual, guys. And take care. I'll see you in the next video. And so now the video's over, I'd like to give special thanks to my patrons, Iradium, Yuki Phoenix, Troy Perkins, Eric Gertson, Tour Guides Guy, and Ringleader, as well as everybody else that's supporting the lower tiers. You guys are forever awesome for the support that you give, you help make things on this channel possible, and I cannot express the amount of appreciation I have for you guys. You guys are awesome, thank you so much for the support.